much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, really, I have great pleasure to welcome you to the seven-day uh, webinar series. Uh, let us, uh, with your permission, we are starting the uh, first session uh, of the program. I invite uh, Dr. Kayam Chiba for welcome address. She is the coordinator of the program. Uh, thank you, Dr. Paslatil. Uh, good evening, all of you. It's a very proud moment, very happy moment to uh, welcome all of you to this gathering. Um, it's, it's, it's like a gathering of people from all over the country. And that's a very happy uh, thing in the times of the pandemic when we are all caught up in our own uh, study rooms, our own books and our own class lectures. Uh, this workshop has been possible uh, for precisely for two reasons. One is the generous financial assistance that the Kerala Council for Historical Research has given us. And two, the untiring efforts of the coordination team, my colleagues, the researchers and the postgraduate students. Uh, as far as the concept note is concerned, it was born out of our own concerns, our daily concerns within the department when we've deliberated on how research is happening, what would the sources be? How would we uh, get things done on, on a new footing? How would we explore new themes? So uh, in a sense, uh, we all had to, in, even in our research days, we all had to start out looking for sources. So sources were a constant source of uh, burden in a way in doing things that we wanted to do. Uh, so uh, can we think about sources? Are the sources out there that we can pick up? And, and use on a ready-made basis. So these thoughts led us to think about our own forerunners, people who have, you know, created data, uh, you know, explored data, culled data out of, you know, uh, uh, hitherto unexplored areas. So that was, uh, in fact, the inspiration behind thinking about this theme. And also to talk about new themes that have entered into history. So in a way, uh, we all have the products of history. They've been published, we have the books, we have the articles. But uh, we wanted to look at the processes. The process is where the historian actually uh, you know, hunts for sources, brings out sources which were never there before. So it's, it's a kind of a self-reflexive journey in that sense uh, for the historian to share the journeys that he or she has gone through. So uh, this is where we want to place the uh, theme of the workshop in that sense. Uh, uh, my duty here is to welcome the gathering uh, on a very uh, informal or formal way. I would uh, welcome the head of the department, Dr. A. Pasilipil. Uh, he's been the uh, source of inspiration for all of us. He's organized this uh, whole department together. I warmly welcome you, sir, to this uh, inaugural session of the workshop. Uh, I, I warmly welcome the Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Dharmaraj P.K., Vice Chancellor of our university. He's been a part of the university for quite a long time. He's a professor of Sanskrit and also a leader in many ways. He's been the leader of our teachers' organization. So he's been uh, in the thick of struggle. He's also been in the forefront of academics for us. Um, warmly welcome you to this workshop and uh, request you to uh, make the inaugural address uh, later. Our speaker for the day is Dr. Michael Tarragon. Uh, I, I have circulated the bio note of Dr. Michael Tharagan to all the participants. He's a very well-known personality and historian. And we wanted to start out with him because his work on migration was perhaps the first in Kerala. And he was one person who had actually uh, really to plow his way into looking for sources uh, uh, about uh, researching on migration. So I warmly welcome you, sir, uh, he, um, to this uh, workshop and also for agreeing to do the first lecture in the series. Uh, I welcome all the participants, especially happy because they're from different parts of the country, very happy uh, to have a platform like this where all of us can meet together. Uh, I warmly welcome all of you and I really hope that you have a very enriching session uh, by the end of this month. All the scholars of history who could not unfortunately be accommodated in this Google platform are out there uh, with us on the YouTube uh, live streaming channel. I welcome all of them. I welcome my dear colleagues, researchers and postgraduate students uh, who have made this possible 24 seven. They've been working around the clock for so many days to make this, uh, to put this workshop on track. I warmly welcome all of you. Uh, I hope all of us can enrich our own knowledge of history and add to the vibrancy of the discipline by participating in this, well, in this workshop. I welcome all of you. Thank you.
Thank you, Shiva. Uh, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Dharmaraya Raj, a distinguished scholar and the former Vice Chancellor of Kannur University, Professor Michael Taragan, my uh, fellow teachers, students, research scholars. Uh, as you know, the, the purpose of the web webinar series has been mentioned by, by the coordinator. Uh, the, really, really, the particular topic is very relevant and useful to uh, uh, the scholars. Uh, undoubtedly, in the present day, the political situation uh, in various kinds of manipulations are doing, particularly in the field of history, they are very much interested to uh, rewrite the history without any scientific evidences or new sources or new interpretations. So the, the, the discipline of history has been challenging in various corners. So at this, at this juncture that we are planning to conduct a, such kind of a, uh, a webinar series. So I hope that uh, our discipline will be enriched definitely the seven days workshop. You are also, once again, I am welcoming you all. Now I invite our honor vice chancellor for uh, inaugural address. Respected chairman of the session, Dr. A. Paslitil, the head of the Department of History, and the coordinator of this seven-day international workshop, Dr. Kayam Shiva, Professor of History, a respected Professor Michael Taragan, the speaker of today's program, and my dear students, researchers, historians, it's a great privilege to be here to inaugurate the seven-day international online workshop conducted by History Department of Sri Shankarajaya University of Sanskrit Kaladi, supported by Kerala Council for Historical Research. The thrust area of the workshop is sensing the past thematic departures and archival researches. And I think the veteran scholars will discuss the theme in detail with their innovative ideas. The workshop will be highly beneficial to the researchers because it gives an opportunity to the delegates to interact with renowned historians and scholars who have distinguished contribution in conceptualizing historical processes. I think the prevailing Indian context inevitably necessitates these kinds of programs to give new light to the young generation. Recently, it is known that the Zander government has constituted a so-called expert committee to establish Indian Puranic tradition as history through popular films. The hidden agenda of these kinds of activities is nothing but the reconceptualization of Indian history focusing on Hindutva. So, the historian's task is indeed very high. This kind of workshop enables the historians to invent new sources for making path-breaking studies in writing history, revising perspectives and themes for perceiving the past in a proper way. In final analysis, this will strengthen the defensive activities against fascism. With its words, I inaugurate this seven-day international workshop and I congratulate all the dignitaries who took the pain to fulfill this venture. Thank you.
Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Now I invite the keynote speaker, Professor Michael Theragan, for his address. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Petzlittel, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Sheba, and dear friends. Uh, I'm extremely grateful for this honor of being invited to interact with such a uh, uh, exciting group of young scholars from all over the, uh, I presume, from all over the world. Uh, it gives me it uh, gives me an opportunity to interact on the basic principles of conducting research, of course, on the basis of concrete experience. On the other hand, it also gives me personally a chance to go back to my own roots as a researcher. Both are quite uh, exciting, quite, quite welcome. Um, therefore, I would uh, ask you to forgive me for being a bit autobiographical, because to go back to my roots, meaning that I have to be inevitably autobiographical. You uh, know very well that my um, subject of discussion today is writing or finding a history of migration, which indicates my basic interest uh, in people who are on the move. But um, normally we come across people who like to stay. I mean, they don't, most of the people do not like to move. Of course, there are exceptions of um, people who would like to travel and see other places and all that, but then, but their life is basically sedentary. I mean, they would like to stay on in a place and build up their dreams and their hopes uh, concretely in that 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 region. Um, and these uh, the exceptions of people who have been asked or been forced to move um, have been, of course, many people have talked about them. Many people have took interest in them, uh, but nevertheless. Are an exceptional group who have to move from their place of, I would call, origin. Now, this interest or this um, subject uh, came as a matter of interest to me personally quite early in my life, not only during my uh, research days, but even early, and that. As we said that, you know, most of the people tend to live uh, in their own place. They don't like to move. Uh, but you should also remember that the Constitution of India, under Article 90, guarantees the right to move as a fundamental right. Um, sometimes we may not think about it uh, think about it when we are involved even in research on the subject. Now, uh, even though this right has been assured in uh, independent India, uh, scholarly attention, relatively scholarly or academic attention to the subject of migration um, is not very old. You know, my guess is that it is at the most, say, of 60 or 70 years. Um, there are various reasons for this, but then I think one of the basic reasons is that the Indian population is, compared to other uh, regions, uh, seems to be a, an immobile uh, population. Um, you know, that may be due to the, you know, our pre-modern period or pre um, medieval period and all that, we had this agrarian system where 
the people who labor on the land, who form the majority of the people, uh, were tied to that land. You know, they were not allowed to move, um, both physically as well as by the rules and regulations of the so, uh, of the caste system. And, and that may be one of the most uh, one of the most important reasons why there was not much movement at uh, at that level. Now, uh, whatever movements that you find, <clears throat> uh, I mean, if you use the census of India and other uh, basic sources of data eh, available in different places, we come to uh, understand that most of the movements take place locally. Um, that means, you know, somewhat uh, one estimate is that 60% of uh, migrations within India, internal migration, is from rural to rural, and that to uh, intra-district, not inter-district, but intra-district. Now, um, in fact, uh, uh, there are people who very strongly believe that the most mobile people in India are the Dudwalas of Uttar Pradesh, who uh, go sometimes even beyond the state borders, uh, to sell their their uh, product uh, outside. Now, but if you look at the statistics that is available to us, then we will be convinced that the greatest movers are women. And who are the women who move? Women who are married and then they move with their husbands to an entirely different place. Uh, this, of course, normally happens locally uh, within the district or uh, slightly sometimes uh, even outside the district. But women on the move uh, are the most uh, numerically the most important. Uh, next to that is of course the rural to urban uh, movement, uh, which is primarily by males. And of course now women are also moving, but mostly it is uh, male people who were uh, going in search of a better income or better living conditions, etc. Now, <clears throat> both these kinds of movements are normally taken for granted because it has happened uh, everywhere by all sorts of people. And then, you know, you take it for granted. And um, uh, uh, the studies are mainly uh, of uh, economic and uh, labor availability kind of perspectives or even social studies have been there. Um, there have also been um, qualitative studies, quantitative studies, as well as uh, ethnographic studies on, on migration. Now, uh, according to Ram Babu Bhakat, who has done uh, very interesting studies on uh, migration, I'm, I'm quoting him. Uh, migration, which shapes social structures, cultures, and history, are um, not normally looked at based on social theories, unquote. Now, this is a very, very um, interesting and also a very provocative kind of statement to, to scholars or researchers everywhere. Now, <clears throat> there, are, <clears throat> there are social networks that enable and um, uh, co um, constitute uh, migration. And um, there is uh, one of the important points which is still being debated is the specific role of poverty in migration. Are people moving because they're poor, they're desperately poor, and they're seeking some way out? I mean, that, of course, there are people who uh, do not consider it as to be a major uh, factor in, in, in migration. Because uh, right now there is uh, a, a, an argument, uh, a, a, a finding that the Mahatma Gandhi National uh, Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme or Act has, um, on the whole, uh, increased the bargaining power of agriculture laborers, uh, including giving them higher wages, uh, improved economic outcomes and has resulted in reduced uh, distress migration. 
But if you look at uh, uh, most of the experiences that we have around us, so people having moved um, in large numbers, uh, this, there is an element of, of um, deprivation or distrust uh, attached to the whole, whole story. Uh, what it is, we will, uh, we will come to. In. Now, most of the uh, people are, as we mentioned earlier, are sedentary. Uh, perhaps from the time of the so-called uh, Neolithic revolution, which of course is now not a very fashionable term, but um, because you know, with the coming of settled agriculture, settled do domestication of animals and uh, fishing, um, people tend to live uh, in, in, in one place uh, alone. Um, perhaps an exception to this uh, may be the fisher people, because for them, even now, their ability to, to have a catch, have, a, uh, have something to eat, is dependent upon chance, even with the modern technologies that is being used and all that. Um, most of it depends upon chance, and uh, chance need not come up in one place alone. So you'll have to uh, travel, you'll have to move uh, to places where fish catches are better, and therefore there is a nomadic character or, or a movement, uh, a character of migra migratory movements among fisher people more than uh, others who have substituted domestication of animals for hunting and uh, and um, uh, and farmers who have uh, also um, substituted their gleaning uh, from trees and other plants to settled uh, agriculture now um, uh, even with this kind of a long history of sedentary life, uh, you you find that there are nomadic people who are considered to be the exceptions. And um, you, you know, even now in a nomadic, you, know, you must have heard stories about how gypsies were uh, considered in Europe as a kind of a kind of a uh, in quotation curious people. I mean, you know, a kind of a uh, people from outside who should not be uh, dealt with directly and all that. Now, um, yet there are occasions when even the most sedentary people uh, will have to move, uh, uh, just like nomads. I mean, when they have to move, they have to move with uh, whatever positions that they can take with them and, and move to distant places. Um, now, under uh, uh, this is mainly happens in in cases of natural disasters, uh, wars, and famines, etc., etc. There are other reasons also could have uh, could have switched off uh, such migratory movements. So even in a group migration, need not be an individual migration. Uh, the people on the move will be leaving the security provided by their own family, um, their own, say, community, and also working conditions to which they are used to, and of course, social relations in which they are comfortable. Now, um, and of course, they have to move into unsettled, unmapped uh, social and physical uh, regions, um, where they would require a very, very uh, important uh, requirement is to have correct information, where they are going, uh, what they can expect to, to find there. And then, of course, uh, they will also require some initial support. Wherever they go, there should be some support coming from somewhere to, to, to help them. Now, uh, uh, observers may um, debate whether uh, the place of emigration, that is the place from which people move, are losers. There are people who, who argue like that, you know, because, you know, you must be very familiar with this important theoretical concept of brain drain uh, of third world countries losing some of the brightest brains in those 
regions to developed countries um, through migration or whether they are beneficiaries because some others will argue that you know like um, uh, when um, uh, the so called excess uh, in, again in court excess people move there would be less underemployment less unemployment uh, less um, uh, poverty etc etc and because of the remittances coming from outside and all that uh, you know what will be the results of these kinds of debates uh, it should be a, a traumatic experience uh, for the people who move uh, in fact uh, perhaps um, one of the uh, Uh, archetypical uh, work uh, which is uh, you know, on on migration uh, of uh, people is of course uh, the nobel prize winner john steinbeck's uh, grapes of wrath you know grapes of wrath is a novel as you know very well um, which uh, illustrates the uh, the the perils and the anxieties and the uh, uh, and also the hopes and dreams of a group of people who had to move from one part of the uh, united states of america to another part uh, there were people who um, had to confront uh, the vagaries of capitalist agriculture with its highly organized uh, banking and farming uh, corporate farming systems and when they came uh, the poor uh, the peasant proprietorship ceased to exist and peasant proprietors found that they have to leave i mean uh, where do they leave they leave all the way to a place called california where they are told that there are uh, grapes uh, being grown and there are wine yards or uh, there and if you go there you will get um, Uh, very good uh, where you will get jobs a plenty so they 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 move uh, in um, uh, in the company of a of a pastor a kind of a, a kind of a priest um, who is um, not an ordinary kind of a priest but but uh, but a person who is uh, inspiring them and 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 uh, and going with them so this has become an archetypical work of uh, of migration uh, uh, all over now um, in a way uh, this is the background in which of course one uh, has to uh, if you are talking about have we lost <laughs> please wait on yes oh, okay. you will come back you are back uh, sorry sir for some reason it 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 got cut off can you hear me yes sir yes yeah. okay yeah so uh, now um, I, as i told you early that you know the problem of people on the move um, was uh, something which i personally encountered uh, quite early in my life um, because you know uh, along with uh, the stories of you know enterprise initiative and uh, leadership you know these are the uh, and also courage you know because the migrants have to be all this because you know when they go to a new place and find uh, uh, means of existence there they have to be all, all this there should be people with some leadership qualities people with initiative and enterprise and also courageous people because you know they will be meeting people who could be hostile to them and all that so uh, this kind of stories uh, was part of my upbringing itself because uh, not that i come from a, uh, exactly from a migrant group uh, but um, Uh, I have got relatives who uh, moved from the the state of uh, Tiruvidangur, or earlier it was supposed called commonly by the name Travancore. So I will use the same name. Uh, uh, the 
the state of uh, Travancore to the British district of Malabar. You know, uh, that, that happened mainly in the late 1920s as well you know, and, 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 and onwards. And it was strong till 1970s, you know. Now, these, um, there are relatives of mine or uh, relatives of relatives or you know, people who, who could tell you all kinds of stories about uh, how they moved and, and all that. And um, uh, these um, uh, impressions, uh, these, these images uh, impressed upon my mind. And uh, when I um, decided to go into a career of research, uh, one of the topics, and probably the most important topic which I, care, which I had in mind, was migration itself. You know, I, uh, after my post-graduation, uh, when I had to uh, apply for my PhD, That of course the fashion in those days, the early 1970s, early 1970s, a large number of people uh, working in the broad area of poor class and the number of people that worked on. On, 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 on. And we need the historians who talked about the agrarian system, which has a demonstrated uh, migration from some sort or the other, like the power and, and the other. So, uh, uh, one of the four categories we um, and uh, here it's a bit and go into a very personal uh, I think it's okay for me to pay respects to uh, those people, people who helped me with my big research. Uh, of course, the first person I have to talk about is of course, Professor Vartanda uh, Varma, who who's not very well understand of history in Indian College Halway where I passed with my uh graduation. Uh actually I uh the migration of farmers would be considered a a peasant movement, you know, peasant movement has got a very different connotation according to him, and and I had to concede that I had to I had to tell him. But my argument was that most of the people who migrated were peasants or or, or farmers, and as long as they are farmers, why don't you why can't we study them as a as a uh, uh, peasant movement? Of course, um, he agreed to uh, be my supervisor. Uh, but then he told me that if you are going to study, uh, among other things, the migration also, you will require um, supervision by a uh, by the ex by an expert in demography and also in economics. And uh, and and uh, uh, he was such a uh, great mind, great uh, person that he himself uh, advised me to to move from uh, his institution, and therefore I moved to the Center for Development Studies in, in, in Trivandrum, uh, where, of course, I had to uh, uh, come down, come down in a, in a sense, from PhD to MPhil. There they would take only for, for an MPhil degree. So I joined there, and there I had to encounter not basically historians, but I had to face uh, some of the outstanding uh, social scientists, mainly economists and uh, statisticians uh, of India, who had got together to to build this institution, led by, of course, the well-known Professor 
Ken, Raj. But when I went there, I had to defend these two things. One was that, of course, that this person, uh, move, uh, migration of peasants is a peasant movement, uh, which, of course, they could very easily demolish. And secondly, uh, I had to uh, convince them that I can study this. Uh, so uh, I'm only saying that, you know, the main uh, issue that they brought out was was uh, brought out was uh, that, you know, there is hardly any data available. Now, what do I do? I mean, that in kind of a, and not only that, you know, uh, I should bring in a kind of a uh, uh, subject uh, that, you know, I, I came from a Mofasil college. I came from, you know, of course, Alway Union Christian College is uh, better than, you know, well known as a, as a good college and all that. But nevertheless, it is a kind of a, uh, in fact, uh, jokingly, people used to say that it is the, uh, that is where the poor uh, uh, students study, because uh, comparing it with the, with the Madras Christian College, which was, of course, much more elite. Uh, so, you know, from that kind of a background, who, without knowing how to write a footnote, you know, that, that's the kind of background from which I, which I came. And, you know, uh, with this kind of um, uh, problem, uh, then when I'm told that, you know, there is no data available, then how do you handle it? You know, I returned to my mother because it is from her that I heard most of the stories of people moving into Malabar. And she had a, she was a very good, very, uh, very um, clear, uh, of course, I suppose all, all, all sons think so of their mothers. She was very good in telling stories uh, and her stories is what brought the subject to, to my mind. So uh, I use that to tap memories of various people who have been, uh, who had gone through this, this migratory process. Uh, but then, you know, I can't uh, put a footnote saying that it is from my mother. I mean, that I, uh, I, I received all this. Now, not only that, as anybody who has worked on oral um, uh, testimonies will know that most of them will be contradicting each other. You know, when, uh, even when two people have been in the same place at the same time, their recounting of the same uh, situation need not be the same. And uh, there could even be kind of disagreements on, you know, it's my family's uh, uh, ancestor who came there first. So somebody else says, says that, no, it is my. So there is kind of a, a number of uh, uh, contradictory uh, statements coming out of there. So um, then I moved into the next stage which I presume was the only way out, moving into the letters that the migrants have been sending to their, uh, to their homes in the home villages in, in Travancore. Now, the way in which the, uh, that of course is one of the major issues in migration studies right now, because where do they get the information from? Uh, where did they get the uh, original information from? Uh, it is uh, now, uh, it is fairly well agreed that it is through letters uh, exchanged between people in Malabar who have been there for other reasons, writing back saying that there are a lot of land available here uh, and it is quite cheap. In fact, you know, in Travancore, uh, at the time when land was being sold at 32 rupees per acre, uh, in Malabar, the same was at an average. Then in Malabar, it was at an average available for four rupees per acre. So there is a there is a tremendous uh, uh, um, uh, difference between the prices of land in Malabar and and Travancore, uh, which would any day um, incite farmers to 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 move. And uh, but these letters. Um, how did these letters come to Travancore? It used to be sent, uh, not every letter, but most of the letters were sent to the priests in the churches, in a parish, they call parish priests, who are in the, in the 
home villages and they after the sunday mass uh, you know sunday uh, every member of the community is supposed to attend the church service after that you know they will hand over this letters and also read it for most of the people who were uh, semi literate or literate so there was this kind of letters but then my search um, didn't result in a large number of letters but some of the letters which i received was of great importance and great uh, great uh, significance now uh, then of course uh, uh, i also try to gather whatever was written about this migration and most of it got published in you know so many is published by the local churches and schools and other organizations in 1970s there were very few but now there are the large number of such uh, publications uh, but i'm saying that this is uh, these kind of uh, data sources uh, really was uh, uh, oral testimonies being written up in the form of a, of an article or a, or a, or a, or, a, or an essay so these are the kind of things which uh, i could make you so uh, but then uh, then of course i uh, i knew that there could be quite a lot of newspaper uh, mention uh, particularly there was two newspapers being published from kotem the town of the district from which uh, uh, town which is the headquarters of the district from which most of the people moved uh called deepika and malayala manorama and i uh, looked through uh, most of their um, archival material mainly of the deepika and i could get a little more um, um, uh, information about the other of the other movement um, but then i ca- came across uh, a source <clears throat> which i never knew in fact i should uh, admit that when i went in to do my research uh, i was not aware of uh, such a source and that source was introduced to me by late professor n krishna ji he passed away in 2019 he was a great mind great uh, brilliant person uh, well known statistician and political economist he introduced me to the census of india and um, you know the census never took men, uh, they never mentioned that there was an internal migration from travancore to malabar it was uh, you know it was not taken uh, uh, that much seriously by the census people but then the demographic data that they collected uh literally opened up uh, pictures very clear pictures of movement of the people or mainly farming people from the plains of travancore first to the hills of travancore so the first movement is from the plains of travancore to the hills of travancore and from there subsequently to the hills of malabar so this picture um literally uh, i could build up with of course the help of professor krishna ji um literally from this quantitative data quantitative data which was uh, which helped me uh, write up on how and where did they go and um, that was that was a kind of a, a kind of a revelation uh, to me Uh, which you know even now uh, after so many years uh, when i sit back and reflect upon it uh, i can't help being excited i mean at the at the at the, at the discovery of uh, of this quantitative data which otherwise with my training as a history, history student uh, normally you know i I'm, I'm, i'm not good at statistics or mathematics or anything like that uh, i would i would i would have discarded them i would not have looked at them looked at them again it is uh, a great uh, statistician himself like krishna ji who introduced me to this 
um, you know, um, familiarity with this kind of historical statistics, not only demographic, but other data. Because along with that, uh, along with the census, I also came across inquiry committee reports, and there were uh, pre-inquiry committee reports done by the Servants of India Society, uh, which at that time, in the 1940s, I'm talking about uh, early 1940s, uh, traveled in these three uh, regions which now constitute the modern Kerala state, Travancore, Cochin, and uh, Malabar, and reported on the uh, famine conditions, food shortage conditions, uh, and, and also migration. And these documents are perhaps the first uh, systematically uh, collected data on these, uh, uh, this very important uh, human experience. And um, using this data and uh, the whatever expertise I could gain from Professor Krishnaji became a, a long-standing um, uh, long standing uh, advantage uh, of in my work uh, even now. Right now I am uh, engaged in um, researching on teachings of Sri Narayana Guru, the foremost uh, leading social reformer in Kerala, and the lowering of child mortality rate in, in this region. In fact, my argument is that even uh, in uh, over and above the introduction of modern medicine and of course that was introduced even in the 19th century but it became um, widespread only by the 1930s uh, over and above that there was this kind of a uh, 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 campaign uh, led by Sri Narayana Guru who advised the mothers especially the mothers, uh, when they prepare food for their children, it should be prepared in uh, water which has been heated up. So uh, heated up water will kill off some of the uh, uh, contaminations and make the water, uh, make the food uh, 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 better for the, for the children. And that seems to have had an effect upon particularly the so-called uh, lower caste, you know, the, the higher, the caste hierarchy, the castes who, are, uh, uh, who were considered to be lower, yeah, among the women of that kind of groups, and they accepted it in spite of the problem that they had to incur um, greater expenses. Uh, because, you know, uh, heating up means that you have to find firewood and spend time collecting it and all that. But nevertheless, uh, women accepted it and it became a new cultural practice of the people of Kerala. Uh, you see, this is a kind of a question which is uh, normally you don't get data on. I mean, you don't get any kind of you know ready-made data. But this is a kind of work in which the use of historical statistics um, has been of great help uh, to me, and um, I could also quote uh, other studies in other cultures, say like in Norway and Sweden, uh, the um, normal practice was to have the used plates um, uh, sunk in a, in a sink, in a kind of a basin, uh, in, in ordinary water, and wait for the, um, uh, the waste uh, got on, on, on those plates to be moved, removed by the, uh, by, the, uh, by, by the water. And then, because it's a very cold weather, so they would wait for it to, uh, for a while, and then get it rubbed and cleaned and used again. But then uh, associations of women uh, argued that you should have a three-sink system. You should have uh, a sink with water, you should have a sink with soap, and you should have a sink with hot water. Now, this meant uh, a jump in the household expenditure. 
But nevertheless, uh, people were convinced that there is a health argument or a, or a kind of a, a hygiene argument and they accepted it as a, uh, as a practice and it became a cultural practice of that region. So these kind of studies uh, in which I'm even now engaged in uh, was helped by my introduction to the, uh, the historical statistics which um, uh, I had earlier. Now, the empirical aspects of my research was uh, okay. I mean, uh, from these sources, I could talk about what exactly happened. But then there were analytical questions to be answered. Um, and I wouldn't dwell much on the analytical questions because, you know, uh, it is basically a problem of data. I mean, that was what the basic problem which I, which I had to face. And um, uh, the kind of uh, non-availability of food and, you know, food shortage mainly, and non-availability of cultivable land, epidemics, etc., happened all over uh, the state of Travancore. But then, you know, you don't find that everybody in Travancore, every farmer in Travancore, uh, uh, having moved. But it's a particular group which, which, uh, uh, which moved uh, out of that region. Now, why did they uh, do that? When you look at their uh, culture, their agricultural practices, you find that they were not exactly the kind of farmers that you encounter normally. Uh, they were not cultivating the food crops, but they were cultivating, in, in other words, they were not cultivating for self-consumption. They were cultivating um, uh, things like natural rubber, coconut, and other cash crops, you know, like... Uh, uh, you know, none of them could be used to eat, uh, to, to live. You know, you can't eat coconut and live. You cannot eat cash crops and live. You cannot, of course, eat natural rubber at all. So these are commodities which has to be sold in a market and in return uh, receive an income. And that income should uh, be the income for the farming family. Uh, but on the other hand, the... Uh, uh, food crop cultivators uh, directly uh, cultivated uh, food crops, which was usually eaten by the by the people uh, in their own homes, and extra, if there is any, would be sold in the local market. Now, this um, cash crop cultivators uh, or commercial farmers. Ultimately, these farmers became commercial farmers with the advent of the, uh, the, uh, the plantation crops. And plantation crops is, of course, as you know, was basically introduced by the Britishers who wanted to have tea, coffee, rubber, uh, cinchona, pepper, and, and, and other uh, items, uh, other uh, agriculture items. And with that um, combination, the whole uh, economy became commercialized. And therefore, your farming population's income uh, became dependent upon uh, the income that you get from the market. So having a knowledge of the market, having, um, you know, uh, and having the ability to, to traverse through the intricacies of a market became very important for the, um, the farmers in this region. And these farmers, were involved in the fluctuations in the prices because you know some of the for instance natural rubber at one time was considered to be the most um, attractive crop because it used to have a very good uh, price but then subsequently there was this depression period and all that when there was a, a decrease in the prices and when these things happen some of the people make um, make uh, gains out of it and, and, and move forward by linking up some activities with the, with the others, but some other unfortunate people lose out. So there is, a, there is a kind of a differentiation of the middle peasantry. You know, you have the rich peasants or the big farmers, you have the middle peasantry, and uh, you know, deep down you have the, uh, the agricultural laborers or nominal farmers. 
Of this, the middle peasantry, who were the people who moved mainly moved to Malabar, uh, came. Uh, they among them, there was this differentiation. Some of them were starting with say three acres of land, ended up with ten acres, while the other people with three acres of land that ended up with no uh, land at all. Because when you are in a desperate situation, you mortgage your land to your neighbor, and the neighbor takes it. and he becomes richer and you become poorer so there is a kind of a, a pauperization of a, of a sort that was happening to the middle peasantry and um, then that has been theorized that has been theorized by uh, two prominent uh, thinkers one was of course uh, vi lenin um, in using the russian statistics uh, he talked about the demographic you know even by pure increase in population families could differentiate people with and particularly in a context like kerala where there is this dowry system if you are uh, if you have more women, uh, more girls uh, than boys uh, you end up in a big uh, financial burden because they each one of them have to be given a dowry and where do they where do and if that if your house really needs repair or somebody falls sick and if everything comes together then you are uh, and those are the people who uh, of course lenin uh, predicted that you know when there is a differentiation like this the middle peasantry will wither away and most of them would end up as laborers in the land of the people who have gained and who have got big land. and that could have happened in kerala too because that was a time when the plantations were growing and people from kerala uh, were also moving into plantations and they required laborers but what you find is that that is the most important thing i think about this migration was that these people refused to be uh, 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 to be attracted to this uh, Uh, laborers work and wages because that would have meant a social uh, climb down because you know you are you are a land owning uh, small farmer now and if you have no land you would be considered a non entity in the agrarian society so they wanted desperately uh, some go somewhere get new land uh, and also the rich farmers who were also uh, were moving into new crops plantation crops and all that they found that in travancore they wouldn't be able to get uh, much of a much of a new land unless the britishers were willing to sell their land they found that land could be gained could be uh, bought in malabar and they were uh, what was happening in malabar was an entirely different story that of course will require different uh, uh, presentation now these are the people who moved mainly the middle farmers who got otherwise uh, were at the brink brink of pauperization found that the way out was to move to uh, uh, to 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 malabar now uh, these things were what i talked about and uh, but you know uh, what were the subjects which i should have worked on and at that time uh, i was not able to uh, to work on there are many and uh, you know and you know most of the uh, issues which i didn't work on uh, i did not do much work at the time because it was required uh, more reliable data and i should have also used the same methods which i used to get data on this middle peasantry which moved from travancore to malabar to uh, gather uh, information and analytical points about the other groups as well one group was of course the encounter between the uh, migrants and the adivasi groups in malabar which uh, well i did mention it i did some work but it was not much and now i mean now i am working on it and i think i may be able to do a little more work on that now 
then there was this um, uh, problem of encounter with the with the with the environment, which was which of course was an important point, uh, and I, I I mentioned it. But I had only one source of data that was the uh, the forest department's data, uh, where the uh, forest area which was uh, demolished was given, and I talked about that how migration became a uh, became a hostile activity uh, to the environment in many parts of Malabar. Then there was um, two groups whom I did not mention at all. Of course, one group I mentioned in, in passing, that's about the women. And I told you about how women are uh, the largest group, which is uh, part of the uh, move, movement of people all over, uh, and how they are taken for granted. and. That was the case here also because the women moved along with their husbands, and you know, wherever the husband goes, the women. But then, within the uh, structure of the migration, there was tremendous kind of inputs uh, given by the women, and that uh, uh, I could not have neglected. And I mentioned that, but that's all. I mean, I could not do uh, much more work because that was also a, a subject within their subject which was not uh, well exposed. Then there was the Dalit uh, aspects of the movement, uh, of the, of the mi migration. Um, I suspected that there should be Dalits because the Travancore farming was mainly done. Of course, uh, all physical work uh, is mainly done by the Dalit uh, laborers. Of course, uh, these farmers, the middle peasantry was also uh, working uh, hard, and you know they they also were part of this part of the uh, group. But then their situation was very different, and Dalit groups were uh, up to say around 1930s were considered to be bonded laborers or even slave laborers, and sometimes treated as slave laborers. Now they um, they would have also moved. And I found a couple of instances where they they moved uh, on their own, not not uh, along with the with the uh, with their masters, the so-called masters. Uh, but their uh, movement was not mentioned by any of the sources, any of the people who talked to me, or any of the newspaper reports uh, and and others. So that also got neglected. Then there was this very very important thing. Uh, which, of course, I didn't talk about Malabar as such. But then in Malabar, just before the migration, there were large number of deaths. The, the death rate goes up uh, in certain uh, talukas. Um, they uh, were, of course, from the socially and economically vulnerable sections, um, but they died of different epidemics and different diseases like diarrhea, uh, cholera, and other things. That is not in not mentioned anywhere in the original writings uh, of the migrants, who, uh, of the migrants, on their own experiences. Because they would, have, they, they would have come across this, they would have known about it, but then um, that was not, you know, in, in quotation, their concern. Their concern was on something else. But that was brought out by a non-historian, of course, by Tikodian, the famous uh, uh, writer and uh, dram uh, dramatist, who uh, his famous autobiography called <clears throat> Aranga Karnata Nadan is, I suppose, the best source which talks about the kind of miseries through which the home population in Malabar received the migrants. Now, um, some total of the whole thing is that uh, a person who was just learning the ropes uh, of, uh, of research um, could complete his work uh, and get a, get a degree and all that. But that degree is, of course, not the important thing. Uh, but there were uh, that also reflecting on it also brings out not only what I could do, what I could not do is also very important. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Yes, <coughs> thank you, Hello? sir. Uh, okay. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you very much for this lecture, sir. Uh, there are a few questions that have come up, uh, which I would take your permission to raise. Uh, sir, the first, the first question is uh, from Ashraf Ali. He's written how the life in Kerala after uh, the end of Gulf migration. How do you look at the life in Kerala after the end of Gulf migration? It's been typed in the chat box, sir. If you could comment on that. Uh, uh, your Gulf migration is, uh, is an entirely different uh, topic. Uh, from uh, can you can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, yeah, Gulf migration is an international migration where uh, various other aspects do do uh, have uh, a role. And you know, uh, if we have to discuss about international migration, uh, it becomes a larger canvas. So please excuse me for not answering the question uh, because we could uh, discuss it in a in a in a different uh, uh, um, different occasion. I mean, uh, because uh, you know, I'm, 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 I was mainly talking about this uh, internal. Probably I should have I should have mentioned it at, at the, uh, when I began. You know that I'm. Going to restrict myself to internal migration alone. I mean, Thank you, sir. The next okay, question sir. is from okay, the next question is from Gopika Gopinath. Uh, was there any ideological conflict between the newly emerged petty landlords and the native Jenmis, particularly in the background of tenant right issues? Yes, certainly there was because you know this was the uh, beginning of the commerce agriculture uh, in a wide scale um, in Malabar too, you know, because in the uh, Malabar region um, there was uh, uh, there was so much less uh, development of the commercial agriculture um, and and the rise of commercial agriculture really upset the big genmis and the genmi system was very seriously challenged. Now, uh, I have a problem I have a problem in the sense that my charge over my phone is is running um, is getting over. So what shall I do? Check. We'll quickly go over Hello. The, we'll quickly go over the questions. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Ne next question. Yes, yes. This is from Shivadas, uh, who's a faculty of history. He, how do you view the future prospects of migration economy in the post-COVID Kerala? Is there any significance for a research in social economic history? Yeah, you know, I, 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 you know, I can only say that it is definitely something which we all have to think about. You know, I cannot, I cannot have any, I don't have any ready-made answers. You know, uh, I myself is uh, at a flabbergast in, in understanding how the society is being uh, engrossed by this uh, present uh, COVID. Uh, uh, onset of COVID-19, uh, uh, um, but you know, I'm I'm I'm, I'm at a loss. I'm, I'm I cannot I cannot uh, I cannot answer that. You know. So the next question is from Akhil Tangapan. Migration to Malabar generally refers to the Syrian Christian migration. Why is there a lack of studies on migration of other communities? Is it only because of the availability of sources? Uh, you no, know, that is a very interesting question in the sense that there has been work on uh, this migration, calling it a Christian migration and a Syrian Christian migration and all that. Uh, that is because the majority of the people moving, moving to Malabar were Syrian Christians. But then uh, Syrian Catholics, in fact, it is not, not even Syrian Christians, but Syrian Catholics. But then, you know, um, uh, they when there's a kind of an organized kind of not organized by the church but they themselves uh, were organized by their own uh, leadership and all can yes sir can yes sir please yeah yeah but you know the uh, other communities also moved in fact there was the nair service society organized the migration 
and it is uh, that region is still uh, 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 visible and it is and there was also an attempt by the uh, community uh, into into Wayanad Wayanad region then among the Syrian Christians themselves uh, Syrian Catholics themselves there was this um, uh, uh, association called All Kerala Catholic Congress they organized uh, uh, attempt and so there were minor streams all over uh, not only that within this group there was a, a particular group called Kananaya Christians in fact their story is a very great success story I mean success story in the sense that they have now some of the um, well uh, you know comfortably living farmers in, in Malabar and they got there now children of this uh, farmers uh, who migrated or, or their grandchildren are um, away in uh, Europe and, uh, but what I'm trying to say is that different groups also moved in but the majority of them grand majority of them were the Syrian Christians thank you sir the next question is from Srijit K when you wrote in the 80s with the CDS background economics was still the dominant mode of writing history accompanied by hard data. But with the sources you mentioned, like oral testimonies and letters, is a more social history possible of the migration where individual migrant lives could be brought to life? Or is it still the domain of fiction like the Grapes of Wrath? Uh, I, didn't, I didn't hear uh, most of the question. Uh, so I'll go through it again. Can you hear me, sir? No. And now I can hear you. Yes, yes. 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 This is from Srijit K. When you wrote in the 80s with the CDS background, economics was still the dominant mode of writing history, accompanied by hard data. Yeah. But with the sources you mentioned, like oral testimonies and letters, is a more social history possible yeah. of the migration, where individual migrant lives could be brought to life, or is it still the domain of fiction, like the grapes of wrath? Um, well, you know, uh, uh, you know, the sound is very low, but anyway, I, I'll try to answer. You know, the uh, CDS was, of course, um, I don't know how it is now, but in my time, um, it was, of course, um, uh, basically a, a, the economics institute, but then it was headed by somebody like Ken Raj, who I think was more of an interdisciplinary researcher. He was more of a social scientist. And he had a sense of history, which I found lacking in among some of the history professors of my time. You know, a, so um, I was encouraged. I was the only non-economist uh, in that uh, whole group. Uh, um, I, I was a historian. Uh, but then, you know, I was um, uh, encouraged. I was, in fact, I, you know, it is there, working there, I could uh, get hold of this Kolangod uh, 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 archives and you know that all archives have been brought to the CDS library. I mean, uh, but now, now I don't. I mean, I'm, I'm not talking about the present CDS. That that uh, people working now should be able to say that. But then this uh, letters and other thing um, is not collected in one place. That that is the problem. You know. Uh, but there's uh, for people who are doing PhD now. There are other people who have done PhD on this subject. Uh, they have, uh, I presume, have a uh, collection of souvenirs and uh, other other sources like that. Um, yeah, one could try to get them all together uh, in one place, um, and 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 um, that that would be a good way of building up our, our present archives, yes. Uh, so the next question is from Christy Alex Varghese. Uh, he's commented on your lecture. I'm just going into the question. What I felt yeah. missing in your lecture was the absence of the reference to the biggest migration India as a nation faced. The migration that happened during the Indian subcontinent partition. Would you like to comment on it? Uh, yeah, that is, uh, you know, that's why I said, you know, that you know, normally uh, migrations are uh, clear, you know, mainly uh, catch the attention of the people when it happens in uh, 
situation of war or civil strife or natural disasters um, etc etc and you know the uh, the partition um, uh, migration was the forced migration and you know, and uh, who forced it and all that you know that can be discussed at, from very different perspectives but i'm trying to say that you know uh, probably it was one of the biggest migration forced migrations in in world history i mean like you know uh, and you know and people who moved in uh, from pakistan to india and from india to pakistan and uh, india to the then uh, pakistan now part of bangladesh so these are uh, migratory streams uh, uh, and it has been studied by by various people uh, particularly the uh, resettlement of uh, migrant uh, populations in and around delhi i mean delhi and up uh, uh, you know uh, you know but you know that, that i thought was uh, you know major uh, major um, story um, which would require uh, much more time and and much more time to to to, to discuss so the next question is from george kuti mv how to approach the role of church in the malabar migration you see this is a very interesting question in the sense that uh, since it was a syrian mainly syrian christians who moved in um, you know uh, people think that mainly the church organized this you know i find that you know church might have helped i mean i'm i'm, I'm sure that church uh, was a, a helpful factor in the sense that the church organization at the parish level you know at the local level uh, there the church um, the priest was the main uh, person through whom communications were sent and all that but then uh, otherwise the church as an organization was not behind the migration migration was essentially a commercial move commercial move in the sense that you were anxious that you are going to lose uh, your land and um, at that point uh, oh, how do you handle it you handle it by going to wherever that land is available and you know uh, and in that movement they uh, trampled over other people's rights and all that that, that that's all uh, all understood but then they were uh, on the move because they knew that land will be available in malabar and um, what they did was the big farmers also was interested in moving so they in their own way um, carried the middle peasantry with them so for instance the basic uh, example that i can tell you is of dr p j thomas who was the uh, economic advisor to the government of india and professor of economics in first indian professor of uh, madras university he bought 10000 acres of land in and around um, um, uh, chamber uh, uh, sri gandabiram uh, 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 place called ayakot and that land of course he, he wanted to create a colony um, uh, he didn't do that but then what he did was that he uh, brought people from his own village called kuravilangan and settled them there uh, by giving them land uh, in on on preferential term Uh, the next question is from Agza Abraham. How how far can the fact that Malayali Christians uh, led the mi- major migration from Travancore to Malabar? No, I I didn't get it completely. What did you say? How far can we go by the fact that Malayali Christians led the major migration to from Travancore to Malabar? Yeah, that is right. I mean, they are the people who mainly moved, and then you know their contribution. Their, their what they really did was they integrated the economy of the uh, the three um, former divisions of kerala into one in the sense that the commercial economy agrarian economy of uh, modern kerala was extended from travancore all the way to malabar by mainly by the by the migrants because you know uh, there were already there was impulses towards commercialization 
um, in Malabar, and there were also plantations in Malabar. But then the coming up of so many of uh, these people with well versed in commercial cultivation uh, added a new push towards commercialization. And then not only that, they also created a common market in the sense that there were the, uh, along with the, the Indian National Congress in, in, in Malabar region, they were one of the main waterways for uh, the IK Kerala movement. You know, they, uh, and subsequently, when the uh, IK Kerala uh, became a reality, of course, the leadership had changed, and it was uh, mainly under the leftist leadership. But then uh, uh, the original IK Kerala movement committee headed by K. Kalapan, after he resigned, it was uh, 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 Damodar Menon. And Damodar Menon talks in his own biography, uh, autobiography, talks about the contribution and support that they received from the migrants. Because they wanted a common market, because they wanted to buy and sell whatever things that they wanted uh, uh, commonly. I mean, you know, so they were for, uh, and th that is the impact that uh, this um, migration really had. Thank you, sir. Yeah, the next question is from Mubarak, Muhammad Mubarak. How can we use oral traditions to construct the history of migration, given the fact that they are more prone to changes over a period of time? Yeah, that that that's a that's an uh, you know, that's a kind of a methodological question which has to be um, answered in context. In the sense that um, most of the memories of the migration are uh, are uh, carried to from generation to generation through uh, oral testimony, uh, but then oral testimonies can also be put together and uh, assist in a sense that you know obvious uh, discrepancies which has crept in uh, has to be uh, uh, has, has to be worked on um, see for instance uh, right now there are a couple of publications which has come out and in one of the publications i myself has written the foreword and all that uh, these um, uh, publications claim that it is the 100th uh, anniversary of migration, but then you know I don't think that is uh, one can that that is by their own their own uh, recount. They they say that one person from here uh, came to the to the Malabar region in or, or some uh, other region uh, in 1920 or some some date like that. But I don't think one can have a starting date for migration because. Uh, uh, people might have moved with the same intentions even earlier than 1930s. Uh, you know what you find is that the uh, people talk, started talking about the Malabar migration only in the late 1930s and uh, 1940s and early 50s. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Anushri. How much is the concept of modernity related to the process of migration? Yeah, modernity, if you see commercial agriculture, modern uh, 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 formation of markets, and also banks and transportation facilities, uh, you know, as part of the, um, uh, of course, mod mo modernism can mean many things, many things to many people, but I'm saying that if you take these um, uh, individual factors as part of the modernizing uh, uh, thrust, then uh, the migration was a major contributor to that. In fact, you know, the, um, if you take the, I mean, I've, I've done that, you know, in my earlier writings, the, if you take the number of uh, mileage of roads built by the people belonging to the, the, the migrant community uh, and the mileage of roads built by the uh, 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 Malabar PWD and subsequently by the Kerala PWD up to, a, up to a particular period, you find that 
it is almost equal. I mean, in fact, in, in certain cases, it seems to be higher in the, uh, side, on the side of the migrants. Because they were, once they were there, you know, they wanted to create all the facilities that a modern society uh, buying and selling things required. And not only that, they brought with them the uh, yearly cropping pepper. Pepper is one of the main crops that they brought. And not that they brought, Malabar had pepper for, for a long time. But Malabar had only uh, pepper cropping once in two years. And into that area, a high-yielding variety of pepper was brought by the migrants. And um, Professor C. Balan, who was uh, head of the Department of History in Kannur University, has himself told me that in his own house, uh, when um, uh, when he was young, uh, uh, boys are asked to go to the hills and collect pepper during their holidays. And then whatever pepper that they bring is sold, uh, is used and sold to the market. While, you know, the uh, migrant uh, farmer from Travancore would have never been satisfied with that kind of cropping. He would have had uh, pepper wines all over and seen to it that it, it, it crops every year and he would have collected every one of them and sold it in the market. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Gopika Gopinath. How far the acquisition of forest lands by the migrants affected the traditional land right use, uh, land use rights of the tribal communities? It certainly played havoc with. Uh, in fact, these um, these uh, migrants um, had um, no uh, no idea of. Uh, I mean, you see, they they came from. Uh, the Travancore region, where itself they had a very uh, severe encounter with the Adivasi groups. Uh, and for them, you know, Adivasis were considered to be irritants. They were, see, see, it's like even now, you, you look at, um, uh, I, I can tell you various examples, but it will take more time. Sedentary population all over the world looks on nomadic population with a suspicion, uh, basically. But you know that is what one has to you know to, to work on. And uh, these people who have moved all the way from Travancore to Malabar, they were basically sedentary people, and they were in search of a sedentary way of life where they can make more money, more comfortable life, and all that. And anybody who encroach upon them, see, uh, who were the people who, whom they had to fight? One was, of course, the Adivasi groups, because they had their own very deep sense of uh, ownership. Uh, some groups have been already been proletarianized. Now, Pania group uh, were badly proletarianized by the British plantation labor and uh, migration to Kurg and all that. There were other, but there were other people who had very solid uh, concepts of their own rights over land, and they were considered to be interfering with the land rights of the migrants. And the migrants had a hostile attitude towards them. Uh, then they had a hostile attitude also with the kind of animals around, because animals interfere, uh, wild boar and, 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 and elephants and all that. Uh, demolished their crops and they invented their own um, uh, arsenary to to control these animals. And then they had a they had a major um, uh, problem with the um, the timber traders of Malabar. Uh, and there was also a kind of a community-based distinction between timber traders in Malabar were mainly Muslims. And the far migrant farmers were mainly Christians from from uh, from Travancore. These two groups clashed with each other no. because the Jenmis, uh, uh, they gave the same land to uh, 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 to uh, bring down the uh, timber 
for the timber traders and also the same land for farming to the uh, salmon core uh, migrants. But you know, you know that when you have the same right over the same land, uh, it wouldn't go peacefully. And there was a whole lot of, uh, all lot of uh, uh, friction, a lot of battles. In fact, you know, uh, one document I've seen describes it as a battle of Chambanoda. You know, they, they call it a battle uh, of Chambanoda between the players. And, uh, so several groups in Malabar, um, men as well as animals, uh, you know, animals meaning, you know, environment has been demolished. Uh, along with that animals and also people, people meaning, you know, uh, Adivasis, uh, timber traders, they were considered to be hostile and then it was a early stories were not very, very, very uh, peaceful stories. Thank you, sir. Next question is, were the newly migrant people from Travancore to Malabar persuaded to embrace new religious practices? Were they? Uh, persuaded to embrace new religious practices. The migrants from... New religious practices. Yes, sir. Uh, you see, because, you know, they, uh, the Christians from uh, Travancore, they followed, you know, as I told earlier, the Syrian Christian uh, kind of... Um, they were Syrian Christians. But then, in Malabar, there was no Syrian Christians. Uh, Malabar, there was only the Manglu diocese of the Latin Catholic Church, which is of course a Catholic group, but then they um, they belong to a separate church practice. Uh, then subsequently they had this uh, uh, Calicut uh, diocese. Both are uh, Latin. So they were the people who were uh, taking care of the uh, church requirements and worship requirements of the of the migrants uh, so among them there was some very very heroic very very brilliant uh, uh, humanistic uh, uh, people with humanistic ideas and uh, uh, humane ideas and, and, and all that uh, and I, I can that, that will take a whole lot of recounting uh, so interaction with them um, must have uh, opened up a new uh, because Latin Catholics in uh, in Tamilcore also there are Latin Catholics, but they are they are considered to be separate. I mean they they have their own churches, their own bishops, and all that. But in Malabar they had to work together for a while. But then ultimately in 1953, what the Syrian Christians do is that they appoint um, a, a bishop. And that bishop comes to Tarashedi and creates a diocese for them. And after that, you know, I think it was mainly the the same Syrian Christian formations that um, get upper hand in Malabar too. But of course, uh, right now there may be new people thinking in new ways and all that. that that's a different ah. story altogether. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Haridas BB. Uh, sir, at present, uh, many of the younger generations of migrants uh, in Malabar are returning the, to their ancestral lands. Can you comment on it? Well, uh, that I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't. In fact, I would be very interested in in finding out about that because you know what you find is that you know when I uh, travel last in Malabar. Um, that was four years ago. Um, what I realized was that uh, people who had moved into the interior, to the to the um, hills of Kannur, Kasargod, as well as Vayanad, um, they have, uh, of course, their children, as I said, are mostly employed uh, abroad or in other parts of India. So. What and and the parents are aging, so now what is happening is they want to move from their. They've got very built-up houses, very big houses. Um, most of the houses have got more than one car and all that. But 
they would like to move uh, to the towns. And uh, every 20 kilometers in Malabar, you must be knowing, as for uh, who, who knows about Malabar, would be, uh, this is not a news to them. Every 20 kilometers, you've got a town on the coastal region. So these people are moving into the town. In fact, it is a return migration to, to, to the town. Because their children, when they're um, back from their uh, working area, now there are two uh, airports, one in Kannur and one in Calicut, uh, uh, and one in Mangalore. So they can easily come to the house and visit their parents. And also parents can be taken care of, you know, the hospitals are available. So there seems to be a return migration. Some people were also saying that, no, some of them are moving back to their earlier land. And, uh, but that is linked with new ways of life and new ways of, uh, uh, particularly related to, uh, particularly related to new habitat formations. And that I have not, I have not looked at. I would be very much interested in getting information on that. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Lakshmi Kuru. By the implementation of the Agriculture Bill, uh, is there any chance in the decrease of labor migrants to Kerala? Yeah, there is uh, labor migration from Kerala is, uh, uh, I mean, you mean to say uh, to international Kerala. migration. Uh, no, labor migrants to Kerala with the implementation. To Kerala. Yeah. Uh, that I, you know, uh, unless this COVID upsets everything, you know, uh, unless the economy, uh, the, before the COVID, uh, everything is pre-COVID and post-COVID. Uh, Pre-COVID, uh, Kerala economy was exactly like it was running all along, uh, because in the earlier period, they used um, bonded labor, slave labor, etc., etc., to get your uh, uh, important physical labor requirements met. Uh, subsequently, they used wage labor for that. Now, wage labor uh, became scarce when different other kind of opportunities uh, came up. And along with that, of course, this uh, Malba Gandhi um, National Rural uh, Employment Guarantee Scheme uh, and, uh, and not to have uh, I'll Kutams and, and other other organizations come up, came up. Now they are dependent heavily upon uh, migrants from outside. Uh, they got people from all over the place, Orissa, Bengal, um, probably Assam, uh, to work uh, e even in agriculture. Agriculture, not only in urban occupation, but even in rural occupation, they are they are being engaged. That was the case uh, until this uh, COVID setting. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Shapna Krishnan. How has migration impacted women folk, especially from among the laborers and peasants? Uh, what flow? What flow? Women, women folk, sir, from among the yeah, laborers. Women folk, uh, yeah, women folk. Uh, uh, I, 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 as I told you earlier, you know that's a topic which I have not done much of a work, but I could I could sense one one, one factor that uh, women were uh, I mean they they were willing to migrate because they had to migrate with their husbands, um, but women had to toe the line uh, very strict. The line has been drawn very strictly. Uh, within that only. Uh, women's migration that is the original uh, farmers migration in within which women had to draw the line and they played a role uh, like they were playing in 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 Travanku. Uh, they helped in all the uh, agricultural work and processing work as well as um, uh, looking after the children uh, and all that but then the next generation, uh, when the next generation came up, they, uh, by the time the migrants themselves had started schools, and in uh, Malabar, it was the biggest event was the beginning of the 
Devagiri St. Joseph's College in Calicut. That was the first college that the migrants started. And then they started different colleges. So women, uh, girls were also sent for education. And girls, once they got educated, they got for, uh, got, went in for um, other occupations, mainly uh, starting with nursing. Nursing was one of the major uh, occupations. But other occupations also, they were. So there is a, uh, there is a uh, difference in the next generation. The next generation, I don't know whether they could be called a migrant community because, I mean, they are, of course, a migrant community because their parents were migrants and, uh, uh, and all that. But then, you know, their impulses were not that of a migrant. Uh, the impulses for the earlier migrants were, of course, uh, migrant's impulses. And that uh, has not uh, improved the situation of the women in terms of of their uh, participation in decision making or, or anything like that. That's, that's the feeling I have. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Shafiq KP. What about the history of migration from Malabar to the south? Yeah, that uh, one hasn't uh, yet you know, uh, studied properly. Um, there was, of course, migration due to, see, because Malabar had a and the higher educational standards in Malabar was much better in the sense that they had easy access to uh, Madras and uh, other regions. And um, they uh, who are um, uh, highly educated could gain um, uh, good uh, positions in the government as well as the organized coastal companies, coastal companies run by the, mainly the, by the British, uh, Aspen Wolf, P.S. Leslie, Daras Mail and all that. So there was a movement of, uh, of, of, of that type. Um, but you know, the numbers involved may not have been very, very high. Uh, but after independence, the things um, changed by the time uh, 1957, uh, 56 Kerala, state is formed, and there is a movement, uh, up, of course, up to 1973. Levinowski has done a, a very interesting study of uh, continuing migration from Malabar to Madras, uh, in which, of course, she has um, uh, said that, you know, uh, for a while, Malabar was still uh, under the influence of the uh, Madras presidency. But by 1970-72, uh, time uh, the the that kind of hold is much less, and there could be uh, people moving from one group to the other. Uh, but then I said, told you earlier um, when I began the lecture, most of the movements, uh, most of the people on the move, are uh, local loc uh, people who move locally. Uh, they uh, they move from. Uh, uh, intra district within the district itself, they move for various reasons, particularly due to marriage. Marriage is still very, very important. Uh, uh, but otherwise, it is for mainly getting uh, better jobs, better living conditions. So, that kind of migration, uh, whether it can be coupled with the kind of migration which happened in the 1930s and 1940s uh, when groups, large number of groups of farmers moved to Malabar is a, is a, is a question that has to be handled first. Um, but I'm, 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 more studies are required in that, that region, that, that area. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Sushil Kumar. What about the history of migration from North India? Yeah, that of course is what I told you earlier. The Kerala economy um, is a labor shortage. Uh, economy. Labor shortage in the sense that um, with the kind of education that people got all over, uh, there are more graduates per, uh, in fact, as early as 1967, uh, the UNESCO's estimate 
Tiruvalla region in Travancore had more graduates per square mile at the time. We were counting it in square mile than anywhere else in the world. I mean, can you imagine that? You know, the, that that's the kind of educational spurt that Travancore had. Um, not that you know, um, higher educated people were well educated in brackets, you know, but they were having certificates and diplomas and degrees and all that. And uh, they were um, getting jobs uh, in different places. So once uh, that opportunity uh, opened up, uh, the earlier caste structure, uh, which prevented certain people to move up in the social ladder, also started crumbling in that that respect. You know, they could also get jobs and with the government's policy of reservation and other other uh, um, other uh, factors, they they could also move in, and uh, no uh, uh, no uh, people who are um, coconut tree climbers or toddy tappers or uh, agriculture laborers would 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 like to have their children uh, doing the same traditional kind of work. So there was a movement from that, that kind of families into uh, other kinds of jobs. So there was a problem with uh, uh, semi-skill work and rural semi-skill work as well as uh, agriculture labor. Now, uh, not only that, with the onset of the land reforms, the bargaining power of the agriculture laborers um, rose up and they demanded higher wage rates because they, uh, at least some, some of them, had something to bank upon and their wage rate went up. So one has to uh, deal with that also if you have got land of your own. So this is the kind of a situation in which the Kerala economy went in search of new source of labor. This has happened also when the plantations developed. Plantations developed, they first tried to get the scheduled caste, so-called scheduled caste, uh, into, into plantation labor uh, from the plains of Travancore. But um, uh, very few people uh, went there. Of course, they some of them went there and some of them made a fortune out of it, fortune in the sense that, you know, they could liberate themselves from the shackles of the traditional economy. But I'm saying that they were not enough to run the plantations, you know, the kind of large number of plantations which had, which had come up. Therefore, what they did was that they started the Kankani system and, or an agent system and the United Planters Association of South India, Upasi, had their own labor bureau and that labor bureau went in search of laborers from Ramnad district and Salem districts of Tamil Nadu. Uh, they had already come into Periyar Valley to build uh, the uh, uh, hydroelectric project. So number of people from that region had come in. Then there was another uh, stream of labor migration uh, coming from Kanyakumari. Uh, particularly a region called Ritapuram, from where, you know, um, carpenters, uh, skilled worker, workers, they came uh, mainly to work in some uh, big uh, churches where they were rebuilding the church building. Uh, so they required skilled uh, uh, carpenters and all that. So they, those who came, they practically stayed on uh, because other people from there neighboring um, houses also moved in and there became a considerable uh, uh, considerable move of people from move, movement of people from uh, Kenya to uh, the same pattern was used in but of course in modern times it underwent some modern uh, uh, specifications uh, went in for North Indian migration North Indian migration and using that word for convenience sake, from uh, uh, Orissa, from Bengal, and, and Jark, and, uh, and Asa. Mm -hmm. uh, and they found it attractive because they could uh, 
not only get a better wage, they could also get, uh, according to the people whom I have interviewed, uh, may, uh, particularly from Tamil Nadu, they were saying that there is a liberated uh, society in Kerala. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, even uh, uh, in their own families, there were a lot of restrictions. Uh, and they could liberate themselves from that by moving out. So there are a number of people who are coming in. But, you know, all that got upset by this COVID, uh, onset of COVID. What would happen next, you know, one cannot say anything right now. Thank you, sir. I think this, this will be the last question of the session. It is from Matthew Joseph. Um, can the histories of migration by the church be further commented upon? The construction of memorials, pilgrimages, etc. How does church function as an active presence in migrant life? Uh, you see, uh, the church, uh, I'm talking about Christian church in general. Uh, the Christian church itself has got a uh, visualization of uh, people uh, who are migratory in the sense that you know they are on a on a pilgrimage you know they are uh, on a pilgrimage and uh, Yahweh or God uh, is with us to protect us you know you know you know that's that that's a kind of imagery uh, that is so uh, not only that you know the Christian belief uh, permits you to move because you know you may be a highly sedentary uh, community in, in your own region but nevertheless uh, at the drop of a hat you can move because you don't have to carry anything with you except um, the picture of Jesus or uh, uh, Holy Mother Mary or uh, one or two pictures you can you can carry with you and 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 not only that, your that that your belief system, your training, everything comes with you, and it is being carried on by a group of priests who are, um, in a way, trained all over the world. You know, all over the world, the priests get more or less the same training, though there are differences between Syrian Christians and Kranaya Christians and Latin Christians and all that. But then, uh, and also Protestant uh, Christians and all that. But I'm saying that. More or less, the priests as a group is available everywhere, everywhere there are uh, them. So you can move from, uh, this is one of the main um, thing which I, I, I found out in uh, uh, the encounter between the migrants from Talancourt and Adivasi groups in Malabar. Adivasi groups in Malabar had a sense of belonging because their own forefathers uh, sleep in that land you know and that land is very very precious very very divine uh, for them that land cannot be parted with you know while for the um, syrian christians uh, it was land land to be you know where you can cultivate you can create new crops and you know sell it in the market and make money and um, uh, uh, you also pray they also pray but you know your prayer the christian's prayer is is to this um, uh, a couple of pictures that they brought, and it can be carried anywhere. So, so your God is with you. You know that is the kind of concept that. Um, so, I think that is why the Christian presence is very, very high. But then, my argument was that Christian church as a organizing uh, element was not very active in the initial periods of the migration. Thank you, Professor, for your informative talk and also patiently uh, answering all the queries. Now I invite Mr. Abu for thanks. A lot of thanks. Yeah, okay, sir. Yeah, we have more than 200 participants in our first session of webinar. Sorry for the network issues. On behalf of Department of History, Sri Shankarajara University of Sanskrit, I extend my gratitude to Professor Michael Taragan. He delivered a wonderful lecture. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for your time and thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Are we also thankful to all the participants from various parts of the country and various departments. Uh, thank you.
thank you all for your time uh, and please ensure uh, don't miss the next day lecture we will update you in whatsapp thank you